Thank you, great man. Don't always remember to mash that third button. Appreciate your attendance this morning. Um, what I want to talk about this morning, as you see in the outline, are two great examples of faith. These are two individuals that passed away this week. Some of you uh, perhaps know Brother Jackie Richardson. I doubt many of you, if any of you, know uh, Elise. But these are two influential people in my past life. And I'm not really here to, you know, tell you how great they were. What I'm here to do, and they wouldn't have wanted that. What I'm here to do is to just show two great examples of faith of people that lived during our day and time. They went through the same things that we went, through, we go through. They dealt with the same issues that we deal with, yet they were faithful. Um, Elise was only 38 years old when she passed away on Wednesday evening at 7.10 p.m. Jackie lived a long life. He was 84 years old, although the last few years of his life were difficult somewhat because of failing health. But that's the way it is in life. Some <clears throat> die young, some live an old age and, and see a lot of things and experience a lot of things and die in an old age. But you know, when it comes down to it, we're really all unprofitable servants. We've done what God has asked us to do. But in doing that, God has promised us eternal life. That passage that Jonathan read for us just a few moments from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, uh, I think brings to bear upon us the idea that God has given us a lot. He's provided a lot for us. He has shown us the way. <clears throat> He's provided the sacrifice that we need to wash away our sins, the blood of Christ. And with those things in mind, I want to talk a little bit about the lives of these two in individuals, but I have some scriptures here I think that should bring together what I'm trying to you know, assemble for us today and provide the encouragement that we need to see that we, whether we're young or whether we're old, no matter what our health is or is not, we can be faithful unto God and receive the eternal throne. I want to start with Jackie. Jack, I've known Jackie probably since the mid-70s and spent <clears throat> for about 10 years in, when I lived in Northwest Alabama spent at least a day a week with him over those 10 years. Oftentimes we had periods of a week or more together. And when you're uh, associated with a true servant, a faithful gospel preacher, a faithful, faithful elder, a faithful family man like that, it makes a mark on you. And I'm thankful that I had that opportunity as you see on the, the outline, uh, one of the first things I've mentioned here is that he's founder of RYC, that's Rustic Youth Camp. This started back in the 70s in Birmingham when uh, his children were small and uh, they decided to go save up some money for a vacation. And so when time came to arrange a vacation, he asked the kids, said, well, we've got this money assembled together and there's a lot of kids in our community really and our of our brethren that don't have money to go anywhere, we can do one of two things. We can go on a vacation like we planned, or we can spend some time with them. And that's what they decided to do. And from there, from there it grew to a, a very large facility in northwest Alabama where it continues today. This was not something that came about as a result of institutions funneling money into a certain group for something to be done. It came as a result of a little family of four deciding to help other people. He built many church buildings. I had the opportunity to be a part of that. And the relationship that we developed with a, was mainly a bunch of, of preachers and others maybe that could take some time off to go build a church building for people like a congregation in Wise, Virginia who had no building. Had a little bit of money, but they didn't have enough to finish it. So we would go and build a building for them and finish it out so they'd have a meeting place. Or we might go somewhere like uh, Danville, Alabama, and put an addition 
a rather large addition on a building or Buckhorn, Mississippi or other places like that. People would reach out to Jackie and his twin brother Johnny to come help them. And they'd say, hey, we've got some brethren that need some help. Can you come with us? And that's what we do. He helped countless other brethren in many ways that I, I don't even know about. A faithful gospel preacher, as I mentioned, a faithful elder, a faithful example, a faithful family man, the kind of man that's hard to find today. There are those. I know there are because some of them are here. But you don't find them often. He was definitely not a perfect man. But he was nonetheless an excellent example. Whether we were fishing, hunting, working, studying, or preaching together, he was a faithful example. Let's turn over to John chapter 13. <clears throat> I'd like to read uh, a few verses there. John chapter 13, beginning with verse 12. And again, I want us to look at these passages as they apply to us, not necessarily as they might apply to some individual that, uh, like Jackie that has passed away and done his work here. This is Jesus' example to his apostles. So when he, was wa uh, he had washed their feet, and taking his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, a slave is not greater than his master, neither is the one who sent him greater than the uh, one who is sent, rather greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. And so that's the type of person we want to be. We want to be one that's a servant to others. We want to be one that just thinks about ourselves. And that's the example that's set forth for us in the world today. It's about me. It's all about me, what I can get, what I can have, what I can do, how I can make myself look better. That's not what that's not Jesus' way. Jesus' way was a servant's way. Jackie was also a very strong man of character. I'm turning back to uh, the book of Joshua and Joshua chapter one. The Lord, after Moses dies, gives Joshua some instruction. And he tells him to go out and conquer the land just as he had intended Moses to do. And so in Joshua chapter one. Let's go back to uh, verse 6. The Lord tells Joshua, Be strong and courageous, for you shall give the people possession of the land which I swore to your fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your own way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I think the passage in verse 8 especially should indicate to us that if we want to, to do good, if we want to... Uh, do what's right, and we want to prosper in this life and in the one that is to come, but we need to understand that the Word of God is that which comes to us. That's which, that which is in our mouth, that's with, that which we meditate on day and night so that we're careful to do it. And in doing that, he says, we will have success. What is our character? I've got on the outline, what is your character? But what is our character? I want to include myself in that. Character is an essential element of faith and peace. In Romans chapter 5, when the uh, inspired Apostle Paul was writing to the church of Rome, and he wrote to them concerning uh, the differences and the new law and the old law and we, we read about those types of things in, in the first few chapters and he, he really is reaching out both to Gentiles and Jews here trying to get them to see what's important 
in regard to God. He talks about justification. In chapter 5, beginning with verse 1, he says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope and glory of God. And not only this, but we are also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulations bring about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now, not all your translations are going to have proven character there. They will have something else, maybe virtue or something of that nature. But the idea is, is that our character is to be of such that it's to be impeccable from the standpoint that we're righteous, that we're faithful, and that we're truthful. Let's turn over to Philippians chapter 2 and, and see that, that indeed our character needs to be of a proven nature. When he says in, in verse 22 of Philippians chapter 2, this again the Apostle Paul writing, by inspiration, but know of his proven worth that he served. He's speaking of Timothy. Know of his proven worth that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. I think that can be said of those that are faithful. They're serving like a child of God. They're serving like a child of Jesus. They're serving like a child of the apostles in that they're following, and we are following that which is true, that which is right, and that's what we're trying to get people to understand and see, and that's what we're trying to live by because that's what God has told us. In James chapter one and verse 12, James writes, blessed is man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So the idea then, is again, is having the type of character, the type of nature, which would be uh, one that would be subservient to God, one that would be willing to be amenable to his laws, one that would be willing to have the love and show the love and, and, and hope for others and wish them well in their journey to be righteous and true in God. That type of person is certainly a joy to all. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13, we see that, let's go back to verse 12 to get the complete thought. And so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, Whoever has complained against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, <clears throat> so also, also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. So in our lives, if, if we try and we desire to be the type of character and have the type of character that God would have us to have, then we're going to be the type of person that will be full of love, full of forgiveness and full of care for others. And that's the type of people that we like to be around, isn't it? That's the type of people we like to associate with. That's the type of people we like to be taught by. And that's the type of people we like as students because those are the types of folks that want to do what's right. In 3 John, in the fourth verse, 3rd Epistle of John in verse four, John writes, I have no greater joy than this to hear my children walking in the truth. Literally, Jackie could say that because he and his wife, Bunny, raised two faithful children. They each had two faithful children and they themselves have children that are coming on. So children to the third and fourth generation that are faithful to God, what greater joy could you expect from such a wonderful thing. And then to see the extended family and our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so that's a that's a good character and a good legacy to live, live by. 
And then I want to talk about Elise. And I spent most of the time of our study this morning on Elise. And the reason for that is, is that Elise was, I guess, more outspoken in regard to the way that she had lived and wanted to live and wanted others to live and the example that she left and some things that she had to say. And you have, you see, if you looked ahead, I've got a number of quotes uh, from Elise after I give some information to begin with. And those quotes were taken from a podcast by Julie Warnock Adams that she did with Elise about a week and a half before her death. And so I would encourage you sometime to look up the podcast Just Julie and take 37 minutes to listen to that. It's a very powerful thing. She was a true friend to many, raised by faithful parents who survived her. She was a fierce mother and protector to two young boys who survived her, but she certainly was not perfect. I can relate. I'll try my best to get through this. And I want you to know I don't cry for her. I cry for me. And I cry for all of us. Because we've got a lot of work to do. <clears throat> for such a young person, at least dealt with a lot of issues she had heart heart issues as she was young when she was younger had to have a not a pacemaker but kind of a stimulator put in her heart so that she could live she was told to hold her first newborn son who was premature until he expired she had many other personal heartaches but never complained and I'm reminded of Job and what Job had to say when he lost almost everything he had he said God giveth and God taketh away blessed be the name of the Lord so her personal determination and faith helped her recenter herself as it has many of us perhaps all of us to give back and to do what was right. In verses 9 and 10 of 2 Corinthians 7, the writer states, I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you made sorrowful according to the will of God in order that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to to the will of God produces repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. <clears throat> Elise knew that. She had witnessed that many times. Being raised in a family that was a preaching family and a traveling family, she met a lot of people learned a lot from them and recognized what was important. The fruits of her repentance were evident. Luke 3 and verse 2 were called upon to produce fruits of repentance. So I want to ask you, does your faith sustain you? have difficulty when you have trials where do you turn do you want to throw your hands up do you want to give up or do you want to slow down and make every moment count do you want to think about where you're headed John, uh, Stephen talked about reflecting this morning when we were talking about our study in, in 1 John do you slow down and make those moments count? Do you look in the mirror in the morning and what you see, what you see, do you look deeply enough? Do we focus deeply enough on who we really are? Or are you just looking superficial? 
Would it take five serious surgeries for your faith to kick in? Would you have to be told by the doctor you have four to six weeks to live? And I want to tell you, and I, I may have insinuated that Elise had not been faithful all of her life. She had been faithful. She was just human like the rest of us. And she would not want to sugarcoat that at all. She was very open about her mistakes, but she was also, also open about her repentance. I, I appreciate it for that. So now we'll talk about some quotes that she had to say on that podcast. Concerning the positive way that she has handled her impending and now fulfilled death, she was asked, how do you feel about that? How do you look toward the future knowing that you're going to die? She says, I know what God can do. I've seen it. In Hebrews chapter 15, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. The Hebrew writer says, Let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What shall man? What shall man do to me? <clears throat> she said it's all about living the prepared life. And we talk about uh, being prepared for retirement. We talk about being repaired, prepared, maybe if you're younger, being prepared to uh, marry, being prepared to maybe purchase your first house. Maybe you want to buy your first car. Maybe you're trying to prepare for college. All of those things are important in our lives, right? But not the most important. In Luke 12 and verse 40, the passage states, You too be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. So that's the most important thing that we are prepared for. And she said that Christ died for me. And I know these are kind of random thoughts and, and you, you'll get the context if you go back and listen to that podcast. But these are some of the things that I picked out that I thought were important. First Peter 1, 3 through 5, as we read just a moment ago and reread, she said Christ died for me like everybody else. And everybody needs the grace that was offered up on the cross of Calvary. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore draw nigh with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of See the clarity there in that passage and in that statement and that quote she's made? It's amazing what knowing that you're going to die and understanding when that's coming and that it is coming will give you clarity. And it will make us think about those things that are important. She said, knowing your salvation, there is so much joy so much hope this is not a person that's dug herself a hole and just waited on the end there's a lot of other things I could tell you about her really that might uh, or might not be beneficial to our lesson this morning but things that she did prior to her death wanting to see people having two weeks to live flying to Texas having four weeks to live and calling all your friends together for a big goodbye party. That's the kind of person she was. She wanted to see people and she wanted to tell them how important they were to her. Hebrews chapter 2, let's look at that. Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 9 and 10. But we do see him who has been made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death 
crown with glory and honor that by the grace of God he might taste death for every one. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and through whom are all things and bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of our salvation through sufferings. So Jesus died for us. He went through something much worse perhaps than brain cancer. Much worse than a car wreck. He carried the sins of the world to the, to the cross and died for us. She says, the joy that I feel where, I, where I'm sitting, where I'm looking, ready to go. I wonder how many of us could say that. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be not foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And so as we look forward to our impending death, will we be ready to go? Will we have that joy where we're sick? When asked what she learned from her parents, she said there's always a way to come back. And she meant to God. Always an avenue of repentance. Always a way to reach up to God. And say, will you save me? Will you take care of me? Will you forgive me of my sins? About her boys, she said, they don't get a pass. Bad things happen. This is not their identity. I expect them to be strong men. Speaking up about death, she says, we're not immune to death. Whether it's brain cancer or a car wreck, this situation does not make me special or unique. People die unexpectedly. I got a chance to have a really strong warning Uh, I really thought I could make it through this better than this, y'all. Bear with me. We are the Lord. Thank you. But who of us doesn't need a really strong warning? She says there should be some serious self reflection in our lives. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, beginning with verse 5. let's go back to verse 4 speaking of Jesus he says for indeed he was crucified because of weakness yet he lives because of the power of God for we also are weak in him yet we shall live with him because of the power of God directed towards you Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? She said, this is just, just how I feel about it. We've limited ourselves with the busyness of life. There is no transparency. Uh, and in regard to the busyness of life, she mentioned something that really hit me a heart. And I try not to do this, and I don't recall having done this, but she says you'll see people sitting in a restaurant, and they'll both be over there on their phone. They won't be talking to each other. They won't be talking to those next to them. <coughs> They're busy in their own little mind. <clears throat> and I find myself busy in my own little mind too much. <clears throat> we need to be transparent with one another. We need to learn how to, to uh, rely upon one another. Talk to one another about our issues. The worst thing we can do is keep it in ourselves. <clears throat> and don't try to protect people from what you may be feeling 
because that's why we have so much trouble today with our young people because we as parents have protected them so much they don't know how to handle adversity. I see young person after young person drinking himself or herself to death or using drugs or some other thing just to put away the pain because they can't seem to be able to deal with it. And part of that falls on us as parents because we haven't done the job we need to do to show them how to deal with the issues of life. Show them what death's about. Show them that it's part of our existence here. Show them that pain and suffering is difficult. It teaches compassion. And show them how to love. And one final thought she had. While you have a time, make it right. Don't wait around. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. In working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain, for he says, at the accepted time I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I hope that none of us here, you have four to six weeks to live. But then again, I hope we do. Because I know what it has done for many people that have come under the influence of this young lady. I know what it's done for me. It's woke me up. And I hope that we'll all be awakened and recognize that the things them in this earth are passing away. And as Murphy quoted from another brother this morning, it'll all be burned up. And then what will we have? I hope we'll have a faithful soul. I know we'll have a faithful creator. I know we'll have a faithful savior. And let's look to them so that we might be saved. If there's anyone this morning <coughs> that needs to come to Christ in obedience to his will. If you believe that he is the Son of God and you're willing to turn away from a life of sin, confess his name, and be baptized in water, contacting the blood, Romans chapter 6, then you can walk away this morning free from sin. That's not to say that we'll always be free from sin because we are humans and we fail. Sometimes we commit sin. Sometimes we don't do things we should do. And we need God's help. And we can, as Christians, go to him and ask him for help. And if it's of a public nature and you need to confess it publicly this morning, then we have that opportunity as well. Thank you so much for your attention and your patience with me today. Why don't you come while we stand and sing? I hear thy welcome voice that calls.